Good afternoon, everyone at Cedar Field. I am coming to you live from the tropical beaches of the Fellowship Hall. <laughs> so I have a very interesting background today. As you might notice, I'm very excited about it. We're getting ready for the big luau party this weekend, or this Friday. Um, so I saw it and I was like, Eddie, we have to do the show in front of that. It's amazing. <laughs> so it sure would be nice to be on a real beach, but for now, this will have to do. And this is also very appropriate because today we're going to talk about bananas, which is a tropical fruit and probably would grow quite nicely in an environment such as the one in my background. So it all worked out swimmingly. All right, so you have probably heard the phrase, you are what you eat. And if that is true, I would be a banana. I would probably also, I would be a banana in a bowl of ice cream, to be honest. Um, I probably eat a banana every day and probably have for the majority of my life. If I counted up all the bananas I've probably had, it would just be probably enough to fill the whole fellowship hall. Um, so I was in the car with my friend. We were driving out to the mountains to go hiking the last two weekends ago, and um, I pulled out a banana to eat as a snack, and he said, out of the blue, why are bananas so cheap? You know things about food. And I was like, you know, I don't know. So we had time on our hands in the car, so I started Googling it and learned all kinds of information about bananas. And I thought, well, this just lends itself perfectly to my TV show. So I am gonna share some of what I learned with you and we're gonna learn everything about bananas today. All right, so Americans consume three million tons of bananas each year. I, my brain can't even wrap around like how many bananas that is. Um, I probably contribute to a lot of that. <laughs> um, so bananas are really cheap. If you know, you've ever bought bananas in the store, you can probably attest to that. They're usually about 19 cents or um, per banana. Um, but you know, they're not grown here in the United States. So you would think that because they're grown in far off places and then they have to be um, produce, you know, processed and shipped and they come a long distance and they come over the oceans and stuff like that, that they um, would probably be kind of expensive. But, you know, as we've just mentioned, they're only 19 cents each or so. So they're not terribly expensive. So why is that? So one of the reasons, just kind of a simple reason, is because, as you know, bananas don't last very long. They ripen really quickly in the stores. So they're, you know, grocers are pricing them really low, so they're priced to sell. So that way we're attracted to them, we can buy them up and, you know, uh, we're not, it's not, you know, like a huge investment. We're just, you know, we can buy these really cheap and they can move them off the shelves really quickly. So that's kind of a, you know, a tactic um, by the grocers and, you know, store owners. And then they can kind of make up that cost with how expensive avocados are or something like that. Um, or some other fruit that they can mark up. Um, also, we have just come to expect that bananas are gonna be cheap, so it's really hard for grocers to raise the price of bananas because we are, to, to what they actually probably should be priced at when you consider you know, how far they have to travel to get to us and the fact that they're grown in another country. Um, but because we've come to expect this really low price, it's hard for grocers to raise the price because then we kind of will stop buying them and then, you know, the whole supply and demand takes effect. Um, I was looking up about some information about fair trade and the true cost of what a banana should be. And when you take into consideration all of the, you know, the processing and the transportation and what it would cost to pay a fair living wage to the laborers who are, you know, getting the bananas from the tree all the way to us, um, it would be about 89 to 99 cents a banana. So that's technically what we should be paying um, in an equitable, um, sustainable system for these bananas. But we are accustomed to this really cheap price. So keep that in mind when you're buying bananas. If you see a fair trade banana out there, you might you know, think about spending a little bit more to support some good labor practices. Anyway, my little pitch. Okay, so another reason why bananas are so cheap. And this is kind of the history of the banana in the United States, not necessarily through all of time. Um, so in the 
1876, at the Philadelphia World's Fair, there were two significant, we'll say innovations, not really inventions, um, that were brought to the World's Fair, and that's kind of what it's known for. So one was Alexander Graham Bell presenting the first telephone, so that's pretty significant, but also the banana was was there at the World's Fair. So this was really in 1876, the first time, so to speak, that United States, that Americans were seeing a banana. Um, and so immediately though, they caught on. People loved them, um, you know, they're tasty and people enjoy them, but there was also kind of this notion of, it was the first introduction to the idea of importing tropical fruits from other places. Um, as transportation, you know, became a little more efficient and, um, you know, we were able to start uh, trading and, you know, getting things imported a little easier. And so this idea that like the world was shrinking, so to speak, and that the economy was becoming more global um, was such an important and, you know, exciting notion to Americans. So the banana industry boomed at that point. Within 10 years, there was this company, the Boston Fruit Company, um, which was kind of, kind of had a monopoly, so to speak, on um, the banana industry. And they, you know, they were already doing really well, and I'm pretty certain that the founders of this company were already wealthy, and so therefore they had a lot of capital to invest in the banana business in like these underdeveloped countries, such as, you know, in Central America and some places in South America. So the Boston Fruit Company, just side note, is what eventually went on to become Chiquita, which is pretty common. We all know Chiquita bananas. All right, so this Boston Fruit Company, you know, again, with all of this capital they had, they went into these countries in Central America, particularly, and they just started buying up banana growing land like crazy. Uh, to the point where, you know, they owned more of this land than the actual country did. Um, and so what this did was this kind of, you know, the money they were offering the governments, which again were um, underdeveloped, you know, they were offering kind of an exchange for the purchasing of all this land. They were offering money to develop their government, to develop roads, to provide jobs, and really support the development of the country. So it really kind of put these countries in a place where they couldn't refuse, you know, or couldn't deny these companies this land. So they were taking the money for better or for worse. But what this did is that it gave the, this fruit, these fruit companies huge control over these countries. Um, to the point where these, their governments were almost controlled by and run by the you know, big banana companies, um, particularly this Boston Fruit Company, which then became known as the United Fruit, or United Fruit, and then on to become Chiquita. Um, so that's where the term Banana Republic came from, uh, which I had no idea. But, uh, you know, because, again, because these companies had so much control over the country and the governments because they owned so much of the land and they had so much control over, you know, bananas which were, you know, far and wide the biggest cash crop in these countries. Um, so there was even to one point, um, there was someone who in Guatemala who, who was a big banana resistance, was leading this resistance and he was elected or however there, um, you know, turn of power happens into, you know, and he became the leader, but then there was a coup staged against him led by the CIA under Eisenhower um, to have another like big banana sympathizer <laughs> back in power. And, you know, so it's just crazy. And I'm sure there's a lot more history and politics and economics that go into this, but, you know, all of this stuff was happening kind of centered around economics of the banana so I who knew that you know this little fruit that I eat every day had such a impact on you know governments and all of this stuff more than just kind of a you know your typical little cash crop all right so there are hundreds of varieties of bananas so now we're shifting gears into different information about bananas all right so we so up until the 1950s Pretty much everyone was enjoying this variety of banana called the Gros Michel. Um, 
And then that one was wiped out by the Panama disease fungus um, or in the 50s. And so then we started producing another variety called the Cavendish, which is what we enjoy today. So interestingly enough, the Cavendish is one of the least fla flavorful varieties of bananas. So I would be so curious to um, see what like a different variety would be. Um, because I think that the cabbage dish is pretty tasty, pretty flavorful. Um, but these, uh, so this variety of bananas, they reproduce asexually, which means, you know, they're growing on these trees and they're just basically recreating themselves over and over and over. So that's ideal for industry and marketing, et cetera, because there's never gonna be any variation to the color and the flavor. Um, which, you know, when I think about it, you know, bananas are pretty reliable. Like you buy one from the store and, you know, the, the degree of ripeness usually might affect the flavor, but for the most part, you know, the bananas are bananas are bananas. There's not a real a lot of variation in what you get. Um, however, the flip side to this is that it is very vulnerable to another disease coming in and wiping it out. And then is, that is when we're going to start seeing prices affected, supply and demand, etc. cetera. So um, enjoy that 19 cent banana for now because if you know anything ever happens to our lovely Cavendish bananas, that price will probably go up. Or we might start, maybe we'll get to try one of those more flavorful bananas. Uh, anyway, so there is a disease out there that has, is being monitored by the banana industry. Um, it's been kind of making its way from Asia to Africa, and now it's been seen in Colombia. Um, so hopefully it will not affect our bananas. All right, so um, as you've probably seen on TV or something, bananas, you know, they grow in those enormous, enormous bunches where there could be up to 250 bananas. And you see the, you know, the men climbing the trees and they're hacking them off with the machete. Um, so we call that, you know, and then they break them up into pieces, into like smaller bunches. Uh, I learned that the technical term for that is a hand. Like we usually call it a bunch, but it's actually a hand of bananas. Uh, anyway, bananas are what is, are considered a climacteric fruit, which means it continues to ripen after it's been harvested. So, um, so there is a, there is a point of maturity, which is when physiologically the banana or fruit in general is mature and ready to be harvested. And then some, uh, some fruits and vegetables will then, once they reach maturity, they will continue to ripen um, while they're still on their plant. And then they're picked at peak ripeness um, whereas a banana is an example of a climacteric fruit which can be harvested at maturity and then allowed to ripen off of the banana tree. Um, some other, uh, let's see. So um, bananas, okay, so kind of going on with the ripening process. So you are probably, maybe you've heard of what's called ethylene gas um, and how bananas give that off. So ethylene gas is a natural um, gas that is produced in plenty of fruits and vegetables and that is what causes the ripening process. So it, you know, it sounds chemically but it's perfectly natural. So something that naturally is produced and it, you know, again, like I said, it, um, it causes the ripening process to happen. Um, so some fruits are natural ethylene producers, and then those fruits and vegetables are also sensitive to ethylene gas. So they're, they're producing this ethylene gas to help them ripen, but then once they're producing it, other fruits that are sensitive to it will then ripen even faster. So that whole notion of putting one of these fruits or vegetable in a brown paper bag and sealing it up to help it ripen faster, that's because you're trapping that ethylene gas in it. So it's producing it, and then it's also being exposed to it um, to help it ripen faster. That's also why you can put a banana next to an avocado or an apple or something, and you know one will be giving off of the giving off the gas, and the other will be kind of ripening because it's you know being exposed to the gas. 
Uh, so some other examples of these are avocados, apples, peaches, pears, ki, not kiwis, um, and tomatoes. However, tomatoes are not, tomatoes will produce the ethylene gas, but they're not sensitive to the, um, to the gas. So um, they aren't gonna ripen as fast if they're exposed to that ethylene gas. So that whole idea of putting something in a brown paper bag, like I said, it does help to ripen faster, especially if you put it in with one of these other fruits. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the ethylene gas. Like I said, um, it's just a natural component of the fruit of the banana. Um, and then what happens is that ethylene gas is breaking down the yellow pigment of the banana. So that's why it turns brown. Um, so, you know, the, the pigment that's yellow is a, is a chemical compound. And so that ethylene gas is reacting with that pigment and, and it breaks down and then it turns, you know, the banana brown. So it's kind of like the same process of leaves turning colors in the fall. That chlorophyll is breaking down and then there's like another color being exposed. So again, that browning is just a natural process. There's nothing wrong with a brown banana. It's not gonna poison you or anything like that. It's just, you know, it does affect the flavor and the sweetness and then it's kind of up to you to decide, do you like a green banana, which is gonna be more bitter and more starchy or do you like a sweeter, mushy or softer banana. All righty. So let's see. Another fun fact about bananas that I learned is um, as I was Googling some of this information, something kind of came up and it said, are bananas radioactive? And I was like, what? <laughs> because if bananas truly are radioactive, I would be having a third arm going out of my head because I eat so many. So it turns out that well, and I knew that this part is that bananas are a really good source of potassium. And apparently potassium is, there's a small fraction of potassium that is radioactive. So technically, yes, bananas are radioactive. However, there is not, you know, there is no concern that you need to worry about in regards to this. So I looked up a comparison. So think about when you go to the dentist and you get your x-rays, you know, the four x-rays of your bite wing, whatever. So when you are, the radiation you're exposed to when you get um, those x-rays at the dentist is 0.4 millirems, whatever that, what unit is, of radiation exposure. And we, you know, consider that perfectly safe. No one's freaking out about getting x-rays at the dentist. So, like I said, it's 0.4 millirems. When you eat one banana, you're getting 0 0.01 millirems. So you would have to eat 40 bananas to equate to the amount of radiation that you're getting from just simple x-rays at the dentist. So probably not too concerning. All right. So um, one other little fun fact about bananas is um, there is something in common with bananas and latex rubber. So um, bananas, the, so there are people who have allergies to latex rubber. Um, so the protein that is in the latex that causes the allergic reaction is very, very similar to some proteins found in bananas. Also avocados, chestnuts, kiwis, passion fruit. Um, so people who have a latex allergy may also have an allergy to bananas and some of those other fruits. So interesting little tidbit. When I worked at VCU in the hospital, if you declared that you had a latex allergy, we would not send you bananas for that very reason. All right, so as you know, banana is a fruit, grows out of the ground, and I've said a million times, anything that grows out of the ground is going to be good for you in lots of different ways um, because it's going to be full of vitamins, minerals, um, good energy, it's going to have antioxidants, it's going to have fiber, it's even going to have water content, so you can never go wrong with these um, yummy fruits. So bananas are a good source of vitamin B, um, vitamin C, potassium, like I said, fiber, antioxidants. Um, and the more ripe a banana is, the more antioxidants it will have. Um, so a banana is about 100 calories, which is, you know, kind of what our, in our mind, like a perfect snack amount of calories is 100 calories. A little bit of protein, but it's a really good source of fiber with three grams of fiber that's considered a good source of fiber. Um, 
And so fiber, as you know, helps us to stay regular, but it also can, it has both soluble and insoluble fiber, which um, the soluble fiber is the heart healthy fiber, which can, um, can help prevent your risk of heart disease by helping to lower your cholesterol. It's good for digestion, it makes you feel full. Um, and then that insoluble fiber is the, you know, the, the kind that helps us to stay regular, but then it also provides that good bacteria in our, in our intestines um, that we can benefit from. Um, it also has a low glycemic index, which basically it's a fancy way of saying it won't. It releases the sugar slowly, so it won't cause a big spike in your blood, um, blood sugar. If that is something, especially with diabetes, that's something you have to be concerned about. Um, and again, because of that slow energy release and also the high potassium level, which is good for preventing muscle cramps, it's a great food to eat before you start to exercise. Or if you're doing like a long run or something, it's a good kind of in-between snack too. Um, it'll release those carbs slowly and it'll also help prevent some cramping when you start to get dehydrated and things like that. All right. So, um, let's see. So those are kind of the benefits of bananas. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the banana peel because I heard a joke one time about, um, you know, one of the downsides to eating a banana is that and then you're just walking around with a banana peel in your hand. Because, you know, like I, when I go hiking, I love to have a banana, but then, you know, I feel bad just throwing the peel on the ground because it just looks bad and then also, I don't want to shove it in my bag because then my bag's going to smell like a rotten banana and it gets mushy and you know the whole thing so then you're just kind of like walking around with this thing. I have a banana peel on my desk right now because I didn't want to throw it in my garbage can because then my office will smell like a rotten banana all day. So what can you do with these banana peels? Um, obviously you can throw them away if you have access to a garbage can <laughs> but now none of this I have this none of this is proven by anything reputable that I looked up. This is kind of just more for fun, but this is some stuff that people have claimed banana peels can be good for. Uh, so skin care, such as just um, a moisturizer, it can help with acne. Some people will put a piece of banana peel over a wart overnight and it's supposed to wear the wart down. People will use it as a hair mask, whiten their teeth. You can use it to help sunburn, poison ivy, bug bites, um, you can put a cold banana peel over your head for headaches. Um, some people use it to polish their shoes or their silverware. Um, some people boil the peels to make a tea. And supposedly, well, bananas do have a certain level of melatonin in them. So some people claim that that banana peel tea will help them sleep. Um, some people will ground it up and make a banana chutney out of the peels. Um, you could put banana, now I'm talking about the peel, not the actual banana. You could put it in a smoothie. Um, some people will either, and will put them in water and sugar to candy them, which sounds terrible, but I've had candied watermelon rind and, or pickled watermelon rind and that was really good. So maybe it is good. Obviously you can also just throw it into your compost if you're into composting. Um, so, you know, then I couldn't really find any um, out of the ordinary ways to enjoy a banana. Um, I mean, there's the obvious, you can put it in shakes, in your cereal, your oatmeal, you can make banana bread, banana pancakes, um, smoothies. You can roll it in a Rice Krispies and make fried bananas. Um, and then of course, there's Elvis Presley's favorite way of enjoying banana and to put it, you know, in between two slices of bread with some peanut butter and then people have also claimed he would put mayonnaise on there or he might put bacon in there and grill it. I love a grilled banana and peanut butter sandwich and you put a little honey on top of it, it's really good. Um, so, oh, then one thing I have also recently discovered is you can use bananas to make nice cream instead of ice cream. Uh, so if you mush up some bananas with some avocados and freeze it, I have to say, it's pretty good. And I was a pretty decent, you know me, I love ice cream. It was a pretty decent substitute for ice cream. So if you're looking to cut out dairy or you just want a little healthier snack at the end of the day or any time, it makes a pretty good snack. I will say I put some chocolate chips in it, but that's pretty good. Okay, and so one important thing about the banana peel, which I thought was interesting, is that, you know, everybody knows kind of the whole 
you know, the slapstick jokes about putting a banana peel on the floor and somebody slipping on it, right? So it turns out there has only been one reported death from someone dying from slipping on a banana peel. And there was also one court case where someone sued um, a railroad company because they slipped on a banana peel that was on the platform. But truly, your odds of dying from slipping on a banana peel are 1 in 3.5 million. So you're more likely to um, die from an asteroid impact than actually slipping on a banana. So we shouldn't be too concerned, but we still shouldn't be throwing our banana peels on the ground. Hopefully that's not a problem for most of us. All right, so I have talked your ear off about bananas. I threw in a lot of information. I didn't even get to all of it. I had some other stuff. So as you can tell, I was just really excited that there was just so much interesting stuff about bananas. Hopefully you thought it was interesting too. So we are happy that you were able to join us and hopefully I'll be back um, a little more regularly. We've had some technical difficulties and things recently where the show hasn't been able to um, go live, but hopefully we'll get back to a, a, a normal routine and um, we'll be back to talk to you about some other new exciting topic next week. So coming to you live from the beach, hope you enjoyed our new fun background and I will see y'all next week. Bye-bye.